All right, today we're going to learn about medieval Africa. We have three daily objectives. Number one, Lisbeth made the empire of Ghana and Mali powerful. Number two, explain how Islam spread in North and West Africa. And then number three, define the Middle Passage. So Africa is the second largest continent on Earth. Asia is the biggest. Um, but what you need to know about Africa is that there are few natural harbors, ports, or inlets. Um, there's actually less good coastline than Europe, um, a land which is a third of Africa's size. So even though this place is huge and surrounded by water, there's really not a whole lot of coasts to make, to make like ports and stuff. In the north, we have the Sahara Desert, uh, which actually grows every year. In the south, we have the Kalahari Desert, which isn't nearly as big as Sahara. Um, we've got rainforest down here, and we've got the Setsi fly. So the Setsi fly is an insect that lives down here in what is called sub-Saharan Africa. Get it? Because the Sahara is down here, and it's sub-Sahara. So the Setsi fly lives down here. Setsi fly um, carries a disease that basically kills horses, cows, and donkeys like that. Uh, as a result, people down here aren't going to have those animals. They're not going to have horses. They're not going to have cattle, cows, donkeys, that kind of thing. And it's also going to keep out Europeans because it's going to carry diseases like malaria. So Europeans are not going to come into Africa, not until really the late 1800s, early 1900s, once medications are created that can stop malaria. The north and south coastline, so up here and up here, actually have Mediterranean type climates. The north does because it's in the Mediterranean. The south is just really warm and nice. Uh, this is where modern South Africa is. This is Madagascar. This is Somalia. So the big thing we need to know about Africa, I'm going to go back for a second, is that northern Africa and sub-Saharan Africa are very different places. So the Sahara Desert, there's really not a whole lot of water there. So people up here and people down here really don't talk for like most of human history because of this desert. So the Sahara Desert acts as a barrier between two cultures. We have Northern Africa, which is totally different than Sub-Saharan Africa. So in the North, if you remember Islam and I was talking about the Islamic Empire, this was all part of the Islamic Empire. It was also all part of the Roman Empire. So Northern Africa is actually very similar to old school Europe. It's not that different. Now, the question you're thinking is, do black people live here? Yes, black people do live here. But there's a lot more like Arabic and Middle Eastern people living up here than there are black people. Most black people live in sub-Saharan Africa. So in the north we have Islam, and in the south we have lots of different African civilizations. So again, remember that the Romans conquered North Africa, but this eventually fell to the Islamic Empire. And know that when the Islamic Empire fell, you had lots of different Islamic kingdoms pop up and that these, these largely survived on trade and farming along the coast, because along the coastline is really good land, good soil. So there are lots of advanced African civilizations in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is also going to start communicating with Northern Africa with the, with the um, discovery of the camel. So a camel is an animal that actually comes from Central Asia. But the cool thing about the camel is that it stores a lot of water in its humps, um, which means it doesn't really need a lot of water to cross deserts. It doesn't have to drink that much, which is going to make it the perfect animal to cross south into Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is really when um, people above Sub-Saharan Africa really have start having the first interactions with people in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the introduction of the camel is also going to spur a huge trade boom between African kingdoms in Sub-Saharan Africa as well as the Islamic kingdoms up in Northern Africa. Now the key to most of the Sub-Saharan African kingdoms is gold and salt. So, the, so probably the most important kingdom in mid, mid, uh, medieval African history is the Empire of Ghana. And again, they make all of their wealth off of gold and salt. And they actually trade this gold and salt north with the Islamic kingdoms for advanced weaponry, like guns. So using all of this really cool stuff he's getting from the Muslims to the north, the king of Ghana begins to conquer all of his neighbors. Now Ghana is a theocracy. We have priest kings, so it's also dynastic. Um, 
the king of Ghana has a huge army and he has a very complex and sophisticated government. This is a very complex society. So through trade, Islam is actually going to reach Ghana. Um, and eventually the kings of Ghana, as well as a lot of the people that live in Ghana, are going to convert to Islam. Um, prior to the introduction of Islam in sub-Saharan Africa, most people are animist. They practice animism, which is kind of like the belief in like nature spirits, kind of like Native Americans. But a lot of Africans are going to adopt Islam. They're going to become Muslim. Um, and in a lot of places, animism and Islam kind of combine into one combination religion. These guys over here are actually practicing animism. I think it's really cool that they can all jump at the same time because I'd never be able to do that. So eventually, Ghana gets taken over by the Empire of Mali um, under the Emperor Sundiata. So the Mali actually conquers all of West Africa between the Sahara Desert to the north and the rainforest to the south. Um, under Emperor Mansa Musa, under Aunt Emperor Mansa Musa, um, the size of Mali is going to double. And Mansa Musa is a really smart guy because he's going to use, he's going to divide his country up into provinces, each ruled by a governor. His capital is the city of Timbuktu. Yes, that is a real place. It was the capital of the Empire of Mali, and that's where Mansa Musa lived. Now, Mansa Musa is a really cool guy. Um, he does convert to Islam. He's incredibly rich by most considered to be the richest man in the world and or the richest man not only in the world but to have ever lived like Ghana Mali does eventually weaken and its provinces break apart into separate kingdoms now the Mali are going to be released by the Songhai and the Songhai are led by this guy named Sunni Ali he is Muslim and he's going to capture Timbuktu and form the Songhai Empire. The Songhai also unite West Africa for a time and continue to spread Islam. And this is going very well for a while until 1591 when an Islamic empire from the north, from Morocco, actually invades via camels Songhai, the Emperor of Songhai, and conquers the Empire of Songhai using advanced firearms. Um, this pretty much ends the period of powerful West African kingdoms. We still have kingdoms here, but they are largely under the control of Muslims from the north. Last thing we need to talk about is the Middle Passage. So we've talked about the triangular, about triangular trade already and how that's kind of mercantilism in the real world, what mercantilism actually looked like. Well, the Middle Passage is its the second of the three routes. So Route 1 is Europe to Africa. Route 2 is Africa to the, to the Americas. Route 3 is the Americas to Europe. So this is the Middle Passage. It's the second one. And the Middle Passage is the passage that enslaved Africans took to the New World. It's very important you know that. The Middle Passage is the name of the passage that enslaved Africans took from Africa to the New World involuntarily. Take a few minutes, answer your three daily objectives.